All right, everybody, welcome back to the latest edition of Saved by the Bellerin, the Arsenal Football Club podcast here and video podcast here on the Sports Talk Line Network. Joining you from the United States, hi, I'm Raphael. And again, we have the full London contingent with us for this episode, kind of going in, going in a semicircle from my perspective. Welcome, uh, Ryan. Welcome back. Hello. Thank you for having me again. All right. And to Ryan's right, uh, is on your video dial, there is Sam. Welcome, Sam. Hello, mate. Hope you're well. I'm well. Uh, and of course, joining us in the hiding behind the icon is Dean. Welcome, Dean. Welcome back. All right. Glad to be on as always. All right. So we have good news. Good news good arsenal material to discuss today. The, the club got back in the win column uh, Wednesday with a two nil victory down uh, at Southampton a uh, team that's been a bogey team for them. So this was uh, very important for any and all reasons, obviously getting back in the win column after the COVID break. Um, lots of topics, lots of directions we can take this in, but let's talk about again, the guy who, you know, we, we, a lot of people, we, berated him. We criticized him for off field, uh, material before the break, but it's becoming clearer and clearer and clearer in the Mikel Arteta, uh, era, how important he is certainly to the club as it is constituted. Now it is, uh, the return of Granite Xhaka kind of heralded the return of Arsenal into the win column. I'm going to start with you, Ryan, because you pointed out that the win percentage for Arsenal football club with Granite Xhaka on the pitch is quite high. It is, and it's actually quite a big difference. You, well, you can see it, where, the way we play. Uh, when he isn't in the team, we look a bit of a shambles in the midfield. There's no leadership, there's no direction, there's no um, voice of the midfield. But when he's there, you, you have that kind of stable feeling. You know, we're going to play more fluid football. You know, the ball's going to be kept and retained. And he, it just looks so much better when he's there. And as I always say, when he, when he plays, we're a much better team. It doesn't matter who plays next to him. As long as he's playing, we, we, we do better. All right. And, and Sam, it seemed that the way that club was lining up, and we can talk a little bit about this. It looked like they were in a kind of a 4-2-2-2 two, two, two with Xhaka and Danny Ceballos at the back. But, um, Jaka and the left side, it seemed like Arsenal was really building something. And this is something players that we've talked about, you know, building combinations going forward, going into the future. Finally, a, a lot of players who have been injured are together. We, you know, Kieran Tierney was back. Jaka was on his side. And then they were working uh, with Saka and Aubameyang. Um, that has promise going forward, not yeah, just in this match. Yeah, absolutely. Um, with, with them three down that left-hand side, that is a very, very solid side. Um, especially if you're going to play a 4-2-2-2. Um, because potentially, well, depending on who who you believe and what, what it is with, with the formation, because sometimes out when we without the ball, we seem to sink into a um, three, uh, five, three, two with Orba on still on the left hand side, but up front, um, Saka coming down into a left wing back and Tierney tucking in. And with the ball, again, either a four, four, two or four, two, 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 dependent on the variants. But it made life down the left hand side very tricky for Southampton because you've got them f- them three quality players all ganging up on their left hand side on their on that side of the defence. And for me, the interchange between Saka and Aubameyang, that that's only getting better. And as I just said with um Saka, he, he can play 
basically wherever you put him because he is so quick to pick up a role and just run with it. And to be honest with you, people say, oh, yeah, he should be a future left back. He should be a future left winger. Actually, he could be a future central midfielder as the eight. Um, obviously, time will tell with that. But with his capabilities and with a new contract looming for him, he this boy is going to be a mainstay in, in the team for a hell of a long time. All right, um, Dean, a lot of promise. Again, a lot of uh, excitement down that left side. Um, they troubled uh, Southampton so much that at halftime they had to replace their right back because he was, he was just being overrun. Um, not, so, not so much success, though, working on the other side of the pitch. And, you know, we, we were commenting about this during the match that while Aubameyang was getting a lot of service from deep, from tyranny, you know, deep passes from, from Saka, you know, he was being, he got let loose a couple of times, hit the crossbar, almost scored on, on the right side. Nicola Pepe was looking very frustrated. He was not getting that same quality of service. And, you know, the, the two, the two players who were uh, kind of trusted with feeding him, Danny Ceballos and, and Hector Bellerin, um, not as cohesive. Maybe you can talk about them. Um, yeah, uh, you know, we, we've we discussed it. Um, it's been discussed already. But um, Tierney to, uh, was it Tierney to Saka, 12 times uh, passes. Bellerin to Pepe, uh, two in that game. Um, the right side seems like a very weak link right now. Um, Bellerin and Ryan's mentioned it a couple of times as well. Hasn't seemed like his old self at all recently. Um, I don't know. There was that whole, you know, inside joke with Arsenal fans that once he cut his hair off, uh, he'd be back to his old kind of self, like the opposite to Samson. It was like his weakness was in his hair, but I think he's gone a bit too short with it. I don't know. He needs to have some kind of balance, but no, on a serious note, I just don't think he's, I don't think he's fully back to himself. And I, you know, I don't want to say because I'm not an expert on sort of injuries and healing and recoup, but I don't see him ever getting back to the Bellerin we once knew, the Bellerin that took over from Debussy, uh, you know, the Bellerin that made his name at the club. I don't see it. And it's it's a very weak thing. Now, going on to uh, Ceballos, I was one of these Arsenal fans that I try, you know, people that know me though, I try and look at the positive and everything. And I try and look at the positives in most players. And in most players that, you know, fans are like, oh no, he's no good. We need to get rid of him. We need to send him back. Don't keep him, etc." I normally try and find the positives in. And I've been defending Ceballos uh, week in, week out. I do think he's a good player, a good player. For where he's supposed to be on the pitch and the role he's supposed to be playing, I noticed it on, you know, day, Thursday night, he, he wasn't creative at all. And he was getting nothing done. Uh, people used to say, oh, he stops, he turns back, he goes sideways, he doesn't make forward. And I was like, well, no, that can't be true. But the more I watched him, I said to you guys, I can see what people are saying. I can see he isn't creative enough for us. And that right side is not... Uh, you know, it's not getting the service it deserves. Pepe's not getting the service it deserves. He deserves. Um, and compared to the left, the left side is dangerous. But someone said it today, it was in, in a report, that it, it, it's an asymmetrical uh, team. And we need to get a balance. And I just don't know, if I'm honest with you, if um, Bellerin's going to do that. I don't know if Cedric's maybe going to get a chance and, and, and show what he's capable of. Maybe we'll see him, and we'll probably discuss it a bit later in, in, in the pod here, uh, against Sheffield United. Maybe we'll see him and see if he, I don't know if he's back for that or if he's back for after Sheffield United. But I'd like to see what he could do down that right side, and I'd like to see if maybe he can make a, a, a difference. But in midfield, I think we're going to have to wait till next season to see what comes with that. All right. And I, I want to pick up your point about the knee surgery. And, and I, again, I don't remember the, the author, but it was a medical piece looking at the rehab that Ceballos had, but also the Rob Holding had. And it lets me segue into him in a moment. But, um, you know, I've had knee reconstruction. I've had the same surgery that those two gentlemen had, an anterior cruciate 
ligament. And I remember I had an excellent surgeon that done that had done hundreds of these procedures and uh, I, w- I had great rehab staff and I was told it's going to be 12, 18 months before you get this, before your knee comes back. And I think a lot of fans don't really understand that you can come back, you can rehab the rest of your legs, your muscles and everything else. And you're back on the pitch. You can be back on in six, eight, nine months. But the delay in that, when you, when you tear that ligament, which is kind of like the anchor between the two bones in your, in your knee joint, Um, it affects your explosion. And that's the last part that comes back. And as we know, in Hector's case, his game was all built about that recovery speed. You know, we, we talked about him when he was, when he first uh, jumped into the lineup, how important he was being able to bomb forward on overlaps, but then being able to rush back if he got caught up field with that, with that amazing kind of sprinter speed. And we haven't seen that. Um, and I, I'm with you. I don't know if that's going to fully come back. And but I also think it might be a bit premature to be saying he's never going to get it back because he's in that window now where that explosion should be coming back. Um, on the flip, though, let's let's move this to the back line. Let's talk about the second of the happy accidents of the season. I think Sam was talking about Saka and and all the due praise that he's had, but you know, another guy who had kind of written off, I remember in our chats, we were talking about Rob Holding being done, right? We were talking about the the makeup of the center back core, but here he comes back. He's pushed back into the lineup because of injuries and suspensions. And he has to play as Saka had to play at left back, you know, at right before the COVID break. And he's turned in two pretty strong matches. Um, Let's wind it back to you, Ryan. Um, we were nervous. You look at those at the at the lineup sheet, and there you see Mustafi, and you see Holding, and you hold your breath, and then ninety minutes later, we're smiling. Yeah, it was a very it was a big oh I say nice surprise really to see Rob uh, back to where he used to be, and it, it it was good to see him put in such a strong performance, a man of the match performance as well, and I think he's needed that. Because in the games he's played under Arteta, in the few he's had, he hasn't shown himself in a very good light. Uh, but that probably would be because of the coming back from injury as well. But uh, Thursday night, he was unbelievable. I, I think he made seven clearances. And Arsenal were under pressure quite a lot in that game. And he seemed to be the one that rolled up his sleeves, pulled up his socks and was like, you are not beating me today. You're not doing it. And that's probably why we came away with a clean sheet and our first win against Southampton at their ground in four years. All right. And Sam, does that change the, the calculus? You know, we were talking about, and we've been talking about it a lot, that Arsenal, we expect, now needs to go out and get two more center backs in addition to William Saliba. Um, and, you know, we, we'll talk a little bit more about Dio Okumakano in this pod, but if Rob holding is regaining his form that he had, you know, before his injury, uh, does that take some pressure off of Arsenal? Maybe they only need to go out and make one more big buy. Um, no, I'd still go with two, uh, personally, because you know what our injury records like, um, especially at center back, um, David Louise cannot be, a third, third choice. He needs to be fourth or fifth choice because actually I think his influence is more beneficial off the pitch than what it is on the pitch. Um, so say if we was to get Saliba in, Upper Meccano, potentially uh, f- look at Fofana coming in as well, um, but loaning him back to set, set enter, uh, I can't say that bloody thing. Set Etienne. Um, yeah, I think with Rob Holding still being here, and also we've got to factor in, bear, and also to bear in mind, uh, Callum Chambers is on the um, injury comeback as well. So, um, looking at our centre back options, I think we're going to be very stocked still, even if we were to bring two more in, but bearing in mind what we've just talked about with the um, 
cruciate ligament injuries because uh, we've got to remember Chambers had that as well. Um, with him, he needs to. I would personally say he needs to go out on loan, on loan, just so he can get his body balanced back with regular game time as well. Obviously, say to the club, you need to manage Callum's Callum's body and his because realistically, it's still a rehab. He's still going to be in the first 12, 12 months of that rehab as well. Um, but sorry, when I say first 12 months, first 12 months back on the pitch, because obviously you do all the strength and work and whatnot anyways beforehand. But on the pitch, the first 12 months, you are going to pick up injuries. You're going to pick up muscular injuries because the body isn't hasn't balanced up. So, with Callum, for me, definitely on loan. But in talking about Arsenal next year, we need a minimum of five centre-backs, personally, because of injuries. But also, you've got to factor in some of the inexperience that we may have in the back line. Um, with Saliba, people may say, say, oh, he's the next Messiah to come in. But with him... People are going to need to be patient. He will be very good, and he is very good now, but he needs his adaption period. He needs to get used to his teammates. He will he will come good, but right now, don't pin your hopes on him being the saviour. Um, Rob Holding, he's coming through his, his stages and getting his body back on balance. So with him, I've always said there's a really good player in Rob Holding. He can be a England international for actually probably the next 10 years, to be perfectly honest. Um, so also, you, then you factor in a, another centre-back. Um, so, yeah, it's just a case of, for, uh, for me, five at the back in the centre-back position. And also, with uh, as I've spoken about many times before, Mikel always wants that, tactical fluidity and different options so having diff- different types of centre back it's always going to be beneficial alright um, Dean you know we we were talking a lot about we started with Xhaka and the importance you know he's the man as I think it was Ryan was saying it offline you don't appreciate how much you need him till he's gone and we really saw that in the two matches that they lost, but they still have two more matches left. The FA cup match against Sheffield United. And then they play Norwich in, in the prem before they go against into that critical uh, four game stretch against the four clubs that are above them, Leicester wolves, uh, Spurs, and um, what am I, what am I say? Oh, Liverpool. So, uh, and that's going to really determine where they finish if they get European football or not. So, Two, it's two more matches where Arsenal need to still need to incorporate some of the missing pieces. And, you know, let's go back and let's talk about uh, the invisible man. Let's talk about Mesut Ozil. Um, we were talking, you were talking earlier about Danny Ceballos. Uh, is he the next missing piece? And, and how, how urgent is it? I mean, you, you and I are going to talk about um, you and I are the two members of the staff that, that have kids, uh, you know, have gone through newborns in our houses. Uh, story came out that his relationship with Mikel Arteta is actually a good one after lots of chatter about whether he's on his way out, whether he's trying to, you know, go back to Turkey, that he became a father over the COVID break. And that that's one of the reasons he's not been up to speed, uh, you know, at, at the level with his, with his teammates. But it seems that he may need more time, but that really needs to cl- that that gap needs to close. And now, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I said last week that I on, on Tuesday that I didn't feel that there was a falling out with him and Mikel, and obviously it's come out since there definitely isn't as you said you know it's it's all about him being a, a new father and you know the personal kind of side to it um honestly though if he's putting himself up for squad selection 
then personally, I don't see why he isn't being used. Maybe Mikel's pacing himself. Maybe he's trying different things, such as, for example, the way he's placed Saka in these different positions throughout the, the last few games. Um, maybe part of Mikel is not writing off the rest of this season because he said himself, you know, that, that, that the team have to have to play like it's all or nothing in, in that way, you know. Um, but maybe he is trying his best to ease through and just get it, get it done. I don't know. But the way I see it, we need Meza. For the amount of times that people have slagged him off and, oh, he doesn't like playing this and he doesn't like doing that and, oh, you know, he's on the bench but he's not even being picked and all this, you know, all these rumours and, and, and this negative rhetoric starts. He is there and he's clearly, he's not turned around to Arteta and said, boss, I can't travel because of this reason or boss, I can't even come to the stadium. He's, he has made himself available for selection. He's on the bench. Two games, I think, it's been now where he's been on the bench and obviously where we can make five substitutions. And it does boggle the mind because as much as I believe that everything's kosher there, everything's okay between them, you know, still he laughs and smiles and jokes with, with Mikel and, and, and his teammates, then why isn't he being brought on? I mean, we've sat there and it's not knocking anyone else, but we've all sat there in, in the group. And when the game's on, certain subs have been made and we've kind of said, why him? Why this player? And I won't name them because I'm not, I'm not knocking the players. But we have. And it's kind of, I've sat there and thought, why not Meza Ozil? This game's screaming out for Meza Ozil to find space. This is screaming out for him to actually do something with the ball rather than seeing Ceballos doing 180s and 360s and losing the football. You know, it's... I can't understand why we're not using him. As you say, there's two more games coming up before the pivotal uh, run of the four, including Spurs and, and, and now the Premier League champions, Liverpool. Um, never thought I'd say that in my lifetime. But uh, it will be just our luck, I guess, that Meza will start against Sheffield United in the FA Cup on Sunday. Right. Well, you know, again, Meza is a long time lightning rod for the fans. And it's strange that even though he was there, you know, we saw him in the second half sitting on the sidelines under a parasol, you know, protecting himself from the sun, that he wasn't the lightning rod, that there was another player who wasn't on the pitch. Uh, and, you know, where, you know, where this is going, we were talking about him on the last pod uh, because he, he was a lightning rod after the last match. And we're, and we're talking about Matteo Guendouzi and, in the last pod, we went in the circle and, and I canvassed the, the, the gents here about where they thought his future lay with the team, whether they should, he should continue to be an integral part of the lineup, whether he should be sold, whether he should uh, go out on loan. And all three of you were unanimous in your opinion that he needed to mature and that perhaps a loan away would be a good thing. Um, more has come to light since that match that, uh, apparently his, his representatives have been in contact with other clubs. There's some guarded statements by his manager about, and, and we don't know that he didn't, Mikel Arteta didn't single Matteo Guendouzi out specifically, but if you read between the lines, it seems that Matteo was one of the players that Mikel was discussing uh, today. In fact, when he talked about having wanting players to get on the boat, to be committed to, to his mission, um, again, we're going to wind back to you, Ryan. Do you want to revisit your assessment? Like you said he should go out on loan. Are you still of that opinion? Uh, no, I think if he's got the mindset that he needs to leave, which the rumors are that he's said that he's not fussed, you, you don't mind departing this summer if the stars align. Well, leave then. Basically, if you haven't got the right right attitude to stay here, fight for your place, fight to change the manager's opinion of you, then we don't want you. Maybe you're not the type of player for this Arsenal. You devalue the club by grabbing a player's neck in the last game and escaping punishment, let's just say. And then 
then come in to, into a meeting with him for a disciplinary and then saying that you don't want to be here no more. You don't, I, I just don't think he deserves to be at Arsenal for the class that we have. And it has been tainted recently. Arsenal's been not seen as a top club anymore. And this is the reason why, because these players come to the club, they take advantage of the management of the, the level they are, and then they just want to leave because they're not strong enough character to, to stay here and fight for their position. And it's, it's cowardly, if you like, to say, oh, I don't want to be here no more. I can't see myself progressing under this manager. But the players we fought that wouldn't, didn't have a future here, Mustafi, Holding all these kind of players, they've changed the opinion of the manager. They've changed the opinion of the fans. Why can't you do that? What What's so different about you? The only reason you look so good under Emery was because he didn't have a system, because he didn't play the way Arsenal should play, and you looked new. You looked better. You looked better than the rest of our midfield because it was a shambles. So, in my opinion, I think he should just go get the highest price you can for him. All right, Sam, that, that recalls a couple of conversations you and I had on pods way back in the Emory era where um, we don't, I don't want to spend too much time on that. That was, that was a really unpleasant period of football, but you know, the, it deserves revisiting in that Matteo Guendouzi at that time under Unai Emery seemed to be the centerpiece, the linchpin of the new Arsenal midfield. And I was a little puzzled by this, this overwhelming support for him because I mean, I was coming to other people, you know, I remember those matches where he was starting every week. He seemed to be the one player who was being started in his position. And what we were seeing was some really just uh, bloodless football, lots of passing around the perimeter, not a lot of speed, not a lot, no cutting edge, not a lot of attack, just a lot of energy, but it seemed to be kind of just spinning in one direction. Um, and I saw that in the match that they lost last week. And that, to me, that was the most astounding uh, thing is that with, again, for all the support of Guendouzi, it came in a match that Arsenal lost. And I just don't want, I just don't want to revisit that, but I, I'm going to give you the similar, similar um, question, because again, you were of the opinion, loan him out. You're, are you still of that opinion or do you have a different option? And, and let me add something else to that because we've seen some big names linked with him. What could Arsenal get from Matteo Guendouzi if they went down that, that route? Okay. Um, so just to dissect this question a little bit, um, going back to the Emery days, if you look at the way that Emery played with the 5-3-2, um, Guendouzi was always in the middle, middle of that um, midfield three, um, or just off, off to the left of centre. Um, and with him in that formation, it's very rigid. You cannot have an attacking essence from that that type of uh, formation. Um, you are very you are very much limiting yourselves to going straight down the middle of the pitch. And at the time, he was our our well our only ball carrier midfielder, one that can pick the ball up on the edge of the area go and dribble more or less the length of the pitch. Um, moving forward, and oh, sorry, just before I move forward, he was starting um, the vast majority of the games. I think he started like 12, 13 in the row. Um, moving forward to Arteta, uh, there was some similarities in the last Southampton game. As I said earlier, it was a 5-3-2 um, out of formation. But instead of having somebody in the midfield that was a ball carrier, the ball would go into Xhaka. So then we can transition into another formation to then pull Southampton apart. Um, moving on to Guendouzi, I was having a conversation with somebody on Twitter, Twitter, well, a Guendouzi fan account, actually. Um, Guendouzi, for me, has a lot of flaws. And yes, he can be top of the charts in progressive passing stats. But you've also got to look at these stats as well as being a bit, 
bit mischievous because I can pass a yard forward. I can keep doing one yard passes forward. I'll be top of the charts because I can constantly recycle that one yard pass forward. And that'll be classed as a forward pass. So the stats are miscued, in my opinion, because even if you're passing sideways, but you're passing a yard forward, it still counts. Um, he he's got a lot of a lot of tactical flaws, as I discussed last week. He will have somebody run past him. He will expect the centre defender to come out and engage instead of him busting his ass back to try and win that ball back. Um, yeah, look, look. At the end of the day, he the boy is a talent, but right now is he a talent that starts every week in that Arsenal midfield? No, I'm sorry, he isn't. He can go to Inter Milan, he'll be a rotational player. He can go to Ju- Juventus, be a rotational player. He will go to, if he was to chose uh, Barcelona or Real Madrid, he will be a backup option. Like, let's not get this twisted. Guendouzi will not oust a single midfielder in any of them teams. And also, I think Man United's been linked as well. So, if you're looking at Man United, their rival, you stick another 10, 15 million pound on top just as a rival enhancer. Um, but in terms of Guendouzi, I think that we're probably looking about, I think we can get anywhere between 40, 40 to 55 for him, to be perfectly honest. And even if the club was smart and go, yeah, we'll take it over, over a staggered amount of time. Um, as as we said on the pod many a times, it's very rare a transfer fee will be paid up front. It'll be immortalised over the um, length of the contract and potentially that could, could fall into Arsenal's hands. We could also say to another club, we'll put a hefty sell-on clause on as well. But for me right now, um, to echo Ryan, Guendouzi, for me, has no future in this club if his heart is not at this team. And if he's saying that he cannot progress under Mikel Arteta, see you later, because we've had worse players progress under him. So, for me, that that's a very easy cop-out. So, if that's the case, his heart's not here, see you later. All right, Dean, I'm going to let you play with the money a little bit then. Sam put a kind of a number on it or a range on it. And this is probably money we weren't even thinking about in the transfer market two weeks ago, right? We were thinking, you know, we were looking at at who could bring maximum return. We're thinking maybe Lacazette going out. Uh, But Guendouzi, let's say it, he does have value. He's young. Um, He has talent. He's got a great engine on him uh, and he's, and he's interested a lot of big clubs. So if I'm sending you out, um, well, let, let me, let me back up too and give you the second part of this uh, because I, I, I don't want to let Mikhail Arteta's comment slide, but it does sound like his statements are aimed in the direction of, pl- of a player like Matteo Guendouzi, if you're in or you're out. Um, and we know that we've learned from the short time that he's been here that he doesn't attack players in the press. He doesn't, he defends his players. He doesn't point fingers. He doesn't single out individuals, but he talks a lot about the culture and are the statements that he continues to make, uh, Mikel Arteta about the culture, um, telling you that Matteo Guendouzi is going out on loan or he's just going out. And again, if, if the, it's the latter, what, what are you looking to get for him? All right. So just to start, I think the reason that Arteta doesn't single out players is because it's pretty damn obvious who he's talking about when he is talking. Um, Now, going back to the whole talk of the culture, he's always got it. 
that's that's the thing, right? Whether or not you thought he was a great player for us, a decent player for you know, he was a player, he always got it. He always understood. You know, he always understood the philosophy, he always understood the mantra. And I said this earlier on, um, when all this, you know, for the past few weeks we've been talking about where Mikel was having a conversation with Ian Wright, um, about you know, convincing people, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, the more I've learned about this whole kind of and, and gone back over the whole kind of thing with Gwenduzi, I believe he could be the person or one of the parties that Mikel was talking about because this seems to have been going on for some time now. Um, also, if we go back to the situation about the player or players not attending the a very important meeting and telling Arteta he couldn't make it or they couldn't make it. You know, you'd have reason to believe that Guendouzi was probably one of those or, the, or that person as well. Um, it seems like he hasn't or doesn't want to understand what it means to play for a club like Arsenal. He's okay telling opposition, oh, I play for Arsenal and I, I earn more than you. That's not what it's about. He doesn't seem to get that. Yes, he plays for Arsenal and it's so much more than that. So when Arteta is talking about the culture and talking about playing for the shirt and talking about this and this, and, you know, I think it's all he needs to do. He doesn't need to uh, belittle players. He doesn't need to put them on the spot because that's not what he's about. He's classier than that, you know, and he doesn't want to throw his players under the bus, but it's just obvious who he's speaking about. So now... With that being said, and, 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 you know, the possible knowledge that Gwendouzi is this kind of, kind of guy, you know, yes, he's 21. But as I said before, I know youth players that have shown more maturity than him playing for the club. And it does baffle me how clubs like Atletico, <clears throat> excuse me, Real Madrid, Barcelona, Man United, Juventus, Inter Milan, are all apparently jumping for, for Gwendouzi. But hey, if they are, let them have him. It's money for us and an issue off of our hands and off of our shoulders. Um, I do feel that if we're going to do this, though, um, I, I don't feel it's going to be alone. I think we're going to use it to our advantage. You know, he has become, if you follow the reports and believe the reports, quite toxic. He's annoyed players, very senior players at that. He's annoyed staff, and he seems to have ticked off Mikel. So you get him off the books. You get him out of the way. Uh, I don't think he's on a great amount of wages. I'm not too sure. But if we can get, as Sam was saying, 40 or 55 mil for him, go for it. But I also feel we could use that to our If we can get a straight 40 to 55 mil, it works. Obviously, I'm amortized and, and whatnot, possibly. But do we then want to look at also what we can do in exchange, perhaps? Because obviously, we were talking about it on the previous pod about players that Barcelona might have that we could take. Um, I'm pretty sure Madrid have got a player or two we could look at. We know there's a player at Atletico Madrid we want. Um, does it Milan have someone we could look at? You know, it's things like that. The thing is, we don't have to sell Guendouzi if we don't want to. But we know he wants to go and we kind of want him out. So we use it to our advantage when these big, big clubs are calling for him. We hold all the cards in that scenario. And on top of that, with every other thing we've discussed in terms of transfers, it seems that we've got maybe six stacked de decks sitting in our office right now because we seem to be holding a lot of cards for a lot of different scenarios. All right, Sam, I'm going to go back to you because if Guendouzi goes out, there's a, there's a spot opened in the midfield. And, you know, we've talked Thomas Partey to death. And again, it's looking more and more like that is uh, step one of the rebuild of the midfield. But if Guendouzi does leave the squad, you know, are we going to revisit uh, the profile of a player you have uh, you've written about, uh, Mark Rocca? Does his does he suddenly pop pop back up on the radar? He's gone rather quiet of late. Um, yeah, I've always said. And I said in the article that Arsenal have put in a bid for Mark Rocker that Espanyol are happy with. I've always said with this, going by the reports that were going at 
at a time that the the transfer, so to speak, and the more of the transfer talk will happen more towards the end of the transfer season. So with with that said, I expect to see be seeing a lot more around Mark Rocker within about two two to three weeks. Um, but going back to the pl- type of player profile, if you're looking for somebody to replace Gwen Doozy, it's Thomas Partey. And you're, that's that's a massive upgrade in itself on Gwen Doozy. Um Going back into the profile of potentially a 4-3-3, four, four, three, three, Mark Rocker fits it. Um, as I said to you boys in the chat, like it, Mark Rocker is like Sergio Busquets, but a hell of a lot quicker. He's like Shaka on AIDS, uh, not on AIDS, on Royd, sorry. Um, so in terms of, of Mark Rocker, he can literally do everything, short passing, long passing, um, strong in a challenge, physical, strong in the air. He is a type of player that Mikel wants in this team. Um, as it was mentioned earlier, Mikel wants a asymmetrical asymmetrical team um, and I believe he made some comments today saying that he hasn't got that at this point in time and to me that that strongly points at the middle of midfield because that is so unbalanced in there um, so as soon as Big Hill can get his players in which I believe will be in the centre of midfield he will progress the team will progress and we would be looking at a top four finish easily, in my opinion. Um, Obviously, the type of player profiles that we're looking at, Mikel has made, he he knows in his head the type of profile that we've got, and it's abundantly clear in the type of players that we are getting linked to now. So, at the end of the day, as I say with a lot of people, I've said that I believe Upa Up Meccano is all all done and dusted verbally. I think Partey is done, just waiting for the transfer window to, to open. Um, Mark Rocker, as I said, expect a lot more of that towards the end of the season because I believe that that is probably 90% done. So, yeah, it, them three players there, we're laughing to be perfectly honest. All right, Ryan, let's, let's keep it in the transfer transfer news. Um, because a player that you profiled, you made a very, uh, intriguing video about, uh, Orkan Koku, the, the, the forwarded Feyenoord, uh, word today from the club, from it's official. Um, he's extended with them. So he's no longer on Arsenal's radar. Um, you know, this is a, a topic we were kicking out and it might be a little disappointing that, that the youngster is staying in, in Holland, but who do you look for um, as a possible, as the next option, if you can't have Kaku uh, coming into the Arsenal squad in 2021? Yes, yeah, it's, it's a massive shame that he's uh, staying at Feyenoord because as you all know, in the group chat and on the previous pods, I've advocated for him quite a bit and I think he's going to be genuinely world class but as you all know my my uh, my favourite is who I, who I want to come in for that midfield berth is uh, Mr Jack Grealish I think uh, everyone knows that now and people are stealing my ideas on Twitter I think um, <laughs> you, to, to, to say to vouch for you you've been talking about him since at least January or February yeah, yeah. and I'm, I think um, if Mikel is dead set on playing Saka at central midfield, you can play Grealish on the left and they can interchange because Grealish can roam into the middle. Saka can go on the outside and we all know Saka's end product from the wide positions. That could work really, really well. But we do have a lot of options that we could go for in that that eight, that number eight to number 10 position. You've got Hassan Awa from Lyon. You've got... Um, Dominic Sabazlai from Salzburg, but um, Coutinho, obviously, who's a, a big, big name who we could potentially swap a couple of players for. 
Uh, what else is there? Havertz would be unbelievable signing, but he's probably going elsewhere. Odegaard could probably potentially look at him. But yeah, we do have quite a few options. But my, my, my one would be Jack Grealish, obviously. All right. So, but you, you put him, you talked about the, you know, you're, Fantasizing about an interchange with with uh, Bukayo Saka, uh, Dean. A lot of hints from that young man after the match yesterday about a possible extension. Um, you want to go into detail on that? Um, well, I mean, I think Mikel has said himself, really, isn't he? That he expects something to be done. He's talking about. Uh, you know, having close conversation with his family, with um, Saka himself. And he's very, it's very positive. He's talked about how everyone at the club loves him. He's a humble young man. Um, he listens. He's attentive. He tries. You know, just everything. Everything just exudes positivity with him. And Arteta is just massively, you know, it doesn't even look like it's, um, what's the word, without sounding crass. Doesn't look like he's sort of begging it. I guess this is the only way I can put it, Arteta, with him and sort of just sort of trying to, you know, lure him in with and charm him. Yeah, that's probably a better way to put it. You know, it's obvious, it's obvious honesty. And so he said he was looking at that. And then you had um, Bakir Saka uh, reciprocate that with an Instagram post of a photograph of him and Mikel, you know, social distance sort of elbow touching uh, after a game uh, with two love hearts um, above where... Mikel, you know, Mikel's head is. Obviously, I love this guy. This is my manager and, you know, everything's awesome. Uh, not only that, but um, earlier this evening, uh, just before we came on to record, um, I believe it was the journalist Sammy uh, McBell uh, said that he expects uh, an announcement for Sucker's extension uh, within, you know, the not too distant future at all. He feels that it's pretty much imminent and done. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of positivity. There's a lot of uh, very good energy going out towards this. And I'm, I'm, I'm very much looking forward to the announcement, that's for sure. All right. Let's go back to uh, the schedule because the next match is we're, we're hopping to the FA Cup, uh, playing a team that's ahead of us in the table, but this doesn't have any impact on the, on the table. This is a FA cup a quarterfinal against, uh, uh, Sheffield United. Um, always talk about how much a club emphasizes a competition like this. And we know that all the matches left and there are seven left for Arsenal and the Prem are, are vitally important. So how much gentlemen, I'm going to go around quickly. How much, um, do you think Arteta will emphasize this game? Is he going to go all out for it? Is he going to rotate his squad massively? Um, again, as I think Dean might have mentioned it. Might we see Mesut Ozil starting in this? Is he going to treat it as a rehab game, um, or is he is he thinking, hey, you know, this it's a chance, it's a trophy in my first season. Let's go for it. Ryan, I'll start with you. Um, I I don't think Arteta. It's going to go weak uh, team-wise. I think he's going to go all out because uh, he did say in his press conference today that the FA Cup revitalized the 2014 team and it made them want to win more. So if he can get that out of this team, who knows, we could potentially move, go on further and further. And as you say, as a trophy, it's the most prestigious cup competition in the world. It's the, most, the longest cup in the world so it's always nice to win it we have them the most out of all of england so that's always nice so it'd be nice to win it again another uh, day out to wembley not for us but for the team um so yeah i think arteta will want to win it because that's it's something special about winning a trophy as a player and then winning it with the same team as the manager so i think he'll go all out team wise all right sam actually i'm, I'm gonna quote you know, a villain in Arsenal world. And, and, and that was uh, Jose Mourinho who talked about, I remember when he took over United and, and they won uh, the Carabao Cup. And he talked about how important it was just to win a trophy as soon as, as possible when he took over a club um, and how that helped build a winning mentality. Um, Mikel's won a couple of FA Cups with Arsenal. 
is he is he gonna push hard on this match? Yeah, I think he is. Um, I think Mikel is a serial winner, obviously, um, coming from a Pep Guardiola bench. Um, he knows what the FA Cup means to Arsenal, and he knows that this team can get to the final and potentially win it um, with the teams that are already which are left left in. Um, so, yeah, in terms of winning the FA Cup, I think that'll be massive to Arsenal season because if we can win that, then it puts a gloss on on a bad bad year all around, to be perfectly honest, in terms of moving around three different managers. Um, but also it builds a very important early building block in Mikel's career. Um, so, yeah, I think Mikel will, will go all out in terms of trying to win this game and also just clocking that um, Sheffield United's first two games after the restart haven't been the most promising. So, uh, Mikel, with his video analysis, will know exactly their strengths and weaknesses. And I believe he'll set out a team that he's, he believes is best suited for that game. Um Obviously, we know with Sheffield United, they play a very unorthodox um, type of formation where their fo- their centre-backs are actually wing-backs and make overlapping runs, but not on the outside channels, on the inside channels. So they try and congest the midfield, midfield um, all the way through to our defence. So, yeah, Mikel, I think Mikel will be aware for it, but he will go and name the strongest team. I don't believe that it will be a more useful, youthful type of team. All right, Dean, I will give you actually first crack. I'll let you talk about, again, is in your opinion, is Mikel going to prioritize this match? Um, who might we see rotating in, you know, of all the players he has at his disposable at his disposal, are there any new ones we're going to see, you know, is Ozil going to start this week and start us off. We'll go around uh, once as we're, we're getting into injury time pod wise here. Give me a prediction for the FA Cup match at Sheffield United. Okay. Um, Formation-wise or personnel-wise, I feel obviously if we had had uh, Leno available, I actually think he may have started Emmy Martinez in this game. Um, So I think he'll keep Martinez in goal. Um, I think he's going to play Socrates. Um, Holdings obviously had two great games despite us losing one. Um, but I think he may, he may have, or he may, um, maybe not, maybe he'll have Holden and Mustafi again and use Socrates as one of his five subs. Um, I don't think I said it earlier. I don't think Cedric's back until after this. So he'll keep Bellerin at the right. Uh, Tierney, he only cramped up. That was the good news with his injury. Uh, against Southampton, we I don't think people picked up on that here. Um, it was only cramp, so I'm assuming he'll start. However, Mikel might want a bit of brute force, so he might start Sayo. Um, midfield, mm, this is the tough one because does he keep to his okay, not to his word, so to speak, but to his I guess underlying phrase and things he's been saying, and does he keep Guendouzi away again uh, after everything's gone on? Um, but I feel um, I feel possibly a midfield free of Shaka, Willock, and Ozil is what's needed. Um, and then I feel a front free of Saka, Pepe, and Aubameyang up top. However, I've got a feeling he's going to start Lacazette um, with, with possibly Aubameyang even on the bench for this one. Um, and I think we're going to win it. I don't know by how much, but I think we're going to win it. I'd say maybe 2-1. All right, Sam, I'm going to wind back to you. What's your prediction for this match? Um, quite similar to this Southampton match, I'm going to go 2-0. Um, I think Mikel will potentially do what he done again with the Southampton, Southampton match I have one one formation for when we're out of out of possession and one for when we're in um, because that seems to bamboozle teams and 
they don't know whether to push on um, when they've got the ball or how to defend it when we've got the ball. So I think that we'll have to jump on them. Um, obviously, they're not in the best best um, period at this point in time, uh, coming off of two losses. So they've got a point to prove. Um, but yeah, I think, yeah, 2 0, I think it's going to be fair, a fair result to us. And I think that we will probably dominate the majority of the game. Um, I think Alba will get both goals. He needs to get back on that goal trail early. And I think that he'll do that within the FA Cup. All right, Ryan, your turn. All right, I'm going to be very positive here. Uh, I saw their press conference. They have a few suspensions, injuries, and whatnot. They're coming off two big losses. So I'm going to say 4 1 to Arsenal. I think uh, he's going to play the strongest front three of Bamiang, Lacazette, and Pepe or Enketio. And uh, yeah, I think we're going to score quite a few. I think it's, it's coming. You can sense it's coming as well. Someone's going to get a slap. And I think it's going to be on Sunday. I think they're going to get a beating. I like you positively. Um, I'm, I'm going to join the chorus. I'm going to say 3-1 Arsenal. Um, I'm going to echo what Sam said. Aubameyang's due. Uh, he's just missed a goal two matches ago. You know, uh, it, it, it was ruled offside, and we've been talking about it. We've been sharing replays. It looked like um, that was a good goal that was denied. Uh, he hit the crossbar last week. He's that close to breaking out. He's dying for a goal. I think he might get two. And, and we've, we've seen with, with Sheffield, they, in their opening match, in their makeup match against Villa, that VAR decision that didn't go for them, that obvious goal that was denied them, that seems to have really deflated them. And as Ryan said, they've got suspensions, but they, their next two matches, they've lost 3-0 in both of them. So this is a team that's, that's in a trough. So, you know, good timing perhaps for Arsenal, but I think everything will we'll sort out. All right, gentlemen, any final news? I mean, we, we have these pods and you guys are checking. Um, there's always new chatter. Any, any rumor that's popped up in the last 30 minutes that we can share with the, with the listeners or today for that matter. Okay. All right. Well then, then we can, we can park it here. And again, with take our, our good arsenal feelings into the match this weekend against Sheffield United, uh, again, joining you from the States, I'm Raphael. And then for Ryan, for Sam and for Dean, let's say so long until next Tuesday. And hopefully we'll have more good arsenal news to discuss. Good night. Saved by the Bellerin is a sports talk line production. This pod features work by Dean, Raphael, Ryan, Sammy, Marissa, and Freddie. Music is provided by Purple Planet Music, which can be found online at www.purple-planet.com. Thank you for listening. <laughs>